All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Today we have a work session, a budget work session at that. It is May 12th, uh, Tuesday. We will do the Pledge of Allegiance first. Do we have a flag? Yep. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, United States to of the America. Republic for which it stands, which it stands. one nation, one under nation, God, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jason Hilders, our Deputy City Manager, will kick off our first budget meeting of the year. Actually, ahead, Mayor, I, I'll, I'll just make a couple of introductory comments. Um, uh, Obviously, uh, we're in unique times, and uh, we wanted to update you primarily this evening and talk uh, quite a bit about uh, some of our uh, 2020 uh, budget uh, challenges and projections uh, that obviously uh, will be in a period of uh, continual refinement uh, as we're able to collect data. Uh, most of our data that uh, we rely on in the general fund is, uh, as you know, our is sales tax base, and uh, that's running behind. We're trying to work on different uh, methodologies uh, from, uh, I know Bernie's had personal contacts with uh, some of our top sales tax producers and have gotten information from them, trying to uh, uh, determine instead of waiting on two month old data from the state. So uh, that's some of our challenges as, as we uh, uh, get into uh, different aspects of uh, our analysis. We'll certainly uh, be sharing that with you as we go. Uh, and certainly different uh, things are popping up all the time with, as a result of uh, uh, the CARES Act and, and different financial packages that uh, uh, may or may not be helpful to us uh, uh, from federal and state sources. So uh, to replace some of that lost data, um, as we said kind of last time we gathered with uh, looking at the airport grant revenue, uh, if we had all administrations uh, or all uh, federal departments providing us grants in that similar fashion, we'd be in a lot better shape uh, uh, for the future. But unfortunately, most of them have uh, substantial strings attached to them for how we can use them and what eligibilities we have uh, for them. So I really wanted to focus uh, on our 2020, but also preview uh, different alternatives uh, as we look at 2021 and developing different scenarios for that. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we had hoped to be able to accomplish in 2021. Uh, some of the, the things we talked about at the commission retreat, some of our initiatives and that sort of thing. And obviously we have other challenges uh, in light of that, but uh, we still think there's some important aspects that uh, we should uh, uh, certainly keep in the forefront of uh, some of our efforts. So with that, I'd uh, turn it over to Jason to uh, uh, run through his presentation. Thank you, Ron, commissioners. Um, hopefully with the shared screen, you're able to see the slideshow. Are you seeing two different pages to it? I think I need Jason, go full yeah. screen again, then click on display. Yeah, let me get that hopefully on one screen. There we go. We still see your notes. Now you're just seeing one, I hope. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yep, that's good. Okay. So as Ron mentioned, we wanted to provide a 2020 update. Uh, what we're seeing from a revenue standpoint and also some of the cuts and savings we are proposing for 2020 and then a preview of the 2021 budget. Uh, we obviously anticipate a drop in 2020 revenues not only in the general fund uh, but even in our utility funds um, when we look at businesses and commercial establishments across the community uh, we're already seeing 
even a slight decrease in our utilities. Nothing major at this point. Uh, the major revenue source for our utility is obviously during the summer and is very weather dependent. Uh, so as we get into uh, the summer months and irrigations, uh, systems start working and our golf courses start watering, that's clearly a very high level of revenue source for our utility funds. When we look at mid-March through the beginning of May, obviously we had that stay at home order. We know retail establishments, um, certain ones were not, limit, were not able to open and others were very limited in their service. Um, as Ron mentioned, we had Bernie and Rebecca Doling and, and uh, Ashley McNatt actually called our top 30 uh, sales producers. Um, we have over 500 businesses in Manhattan uh, but the top 30 represent almost 50% of our entire sales tax revenue sources. Uh, of those 30, 12 refused to give us the data that we will get from the state uh, in a matter of 45 to 60 days after uh, it's receded. Uh, four of the top 30 are closed uh, based on the stay at home order uh, by the governor, but bit of good news of the top five three are steady when they compared March of 19 to March of 20 and two and including our top revenue producer uh, have increased uh, since March 19 for March of 20 and it's indicative of obviously what's going on in the community um, we, we really don't want to share who these are but I think you all can make some very good guesses about who remained open and when you visited these places were they busy uh, more than likely the answer is yes and they fall into our our top five as far as revenue producers go so just to give you a really a little bit of a, a snapshot uh, look into sales tax in manhattan this is our general fund this is a variety of different funding sources that we have. Uh, I wanna bring your attention to property tax assessments, but also sales tax. Uh, when we look at sales tax, 8.2 million, uh, we need to factor in the compensating use sales tax as well. So that's about 9 million. And then let's come down to transfers from other funds. Uh, oh, about 75% of that is going to be sales tax as well. So this is heavily dependent uh, of sales tax. Um, a little less than half are gonna be coming from sales tax. So when we look at the community and we see a drop, uh, these revenue streams are gonna have drops as well. Franchise fees, we are already seeing less revenue come in from Westar, Kansas Gas, who are our major producers uh, of those franchise fees in the community. Uh, we've seen anywhere from um, you know, 50,000 to 100,000 in drops uh, from those revenue streams already. Uh, those were early and they were provided to us by those companies to give us a heads up that these things were going to occur. Um, we know we're gonna take less revenue in court. We know our licenses and permits are going to slip. Uh, airport revenues, as Ron mentioned, we do have the offsetting revenue from the federal government. So that revenue stream will be will be solid. Recreation programs and facilities, the $2.4 million here in our park and rec area, it's, it's really everything combined between the zoo, the discovery center, the pools, the adult and youth rec programs, all those revenue sources that come into the general fund via the park and rec department are reflected in that 2.4 million. On the flip side, some of the savings that we're gonna talk about later, when you don't open facilities and you don't hire seasonal staff to run those programs, you can expect these revenues to drop dramatically. We'll talk about that a little bit later on the pools and the rec programs where we, we are going to save 1.25 million. Uh, and in that savings, you're also not gonna bring in anywhere from a half million to $750,000 in revenue. So that will be coming out of this source directly. Obviously, if the Discovery Center is not open, the zoo is not open, we're not generating revenue there as well. 
When we look at our total revenue streams, as the previous slide showed, the 28.6 million, and we start taking a 10% loss, a 15, a 20, and a 25% loss, you can see our range here that we've talked about with the commission and the community is at three to $8 million range of potential losses or less revenues. When we look at what other cities in Kansas have projected, it's been anywhere between that 10 and 20%. Uh, we've seen some even try to drill it down as far as 16%. I watched Olathe in their city presentation and they went specifically to 16%. Uh, obviously 16% is going to be real close to the 15% number here, just over $4 million anticipated in lost revenues. Um, that, that could be one scenario that we could look at. Um, there are some indicators that we're trying to follow. Uh, and again, I would just reiterate, we don't get sales tax data for two months. So for March, which we know we have half the month under the stay at home order and all of April, it'll be June and July before we actually get those receipts and know what that data truly is. Uh, we're, we're estimating at this point uh, and these dollar amounts are really applied across the entire general fund looking at these significant losses. Wichita State came out this weekend in their Center for Economic Development and Business Research. They came out with forecasts for the entire state of Kansas, but then they also focused in on Kansas City, Wichita, and Topeka. And I wanted to highlight the, the sentence here where they forecasted a decline by more than 20% in retail in Kansas. Uh, this has led to more of an employment figure of 17.8%, but I thought it was interesting that they went as far as 20% reduction in the forecast for retail sales for the state. The other thing they highlighted, and I copied another sentence, was more about hospitality and leisure and the decline of over 27% uh, in that industry and how that will impact restaurants and bars, recreational businesses uh, in their capacity. Um, this is a, a table that was included in Wichita State's Kansas Employment Summary. And I really wanted to highlight the retail trade and the leisure hospitality. And it gives you a 2018 actual, a 2019 it's an estimated number, but it's, it's fairly accurate. But then they have this future number that they project for 2020. And then they show the differences and the percentages. So clearly we know retail trade and all our hospitality that impact our transient guest tax revenues uh, are going to be impacted by um, what has happened in the last six to eight weeks. Uh, you're probably even picking up on national news relative to retail. Uh, people's tendencies to save more, people's tendencies uh, to go to the grocery store, obviously more versus going out to eat and socializing. It's obviously having an impact on supply. Supply is also being impacted by COVID-19 and some of the restrictions uh, the suppliers are imposing on their workforces. Property tax, is a, is a completely separate conversation now in terms of how it's going to be impacted uh, for 2020. We have the first half payments in, in our possession. So in the memo I wrote, we have 18 of $33 million for 2020 collected. And that's true. It includes some of our TIF revenue. So if we back out the TIF revenue for downtown, it's, it's Rena updated these for me and it's 16.9 of the 31 we anticipate in property taxes coming into the city. And just a reminder, RCPD is 66, RCPD and library are 66% of that total property tax that the city collects. Uh, RCPD gets 55%, library gets 11%. So we're waiting on that second half payment. It's due, uh, it was due May 10th. Uh, we anticipate from Shiloh Hager at um, Riley County 
treasurer's office that we would possibly have that information by Thursday of this week, May 14th, to know what that delinquency rate will be. I tried to forecast here at the bottom just what the losses would be for every percent delinquency that Shiloh reports to us on Thursday uh, that they've realized in this second half payment, just the financial impacts of, of those delinquency rates. Uh, RCPD share is obviously a portion of that and one through 5% is what I've shown you. Uh, if we get beyond 5%, clearly, uh, it, it'll go up substantially and that'll be a very impactful loss to not only the city, but RCPD and the library. We've had delinquency discussions in the past between the city, the county and the law board. They haven't necessarily resulted in the outcome uh, that's very desirable for the city. Uh, if we have a substantial loss in this delinquency, uh, I, I've highlighted here that we would need to come together as multiple uh, jurisdictions and talk about how to address this potential delinquency. So here it is where we're at today with our proposed cuts, savings, and revenue offsets. Uh, as highlighted again last week at our meeting, as well as Ron earlier, we do have a substantial amount of money, a little over two million coming through the airport. Um, this $800,000 is essentially paying for the gap between the revenues that the airport generates and its expenditures. So if you'd like to frame it in a way that sometimes we hear uh, publicly, the city has subsidized or made up for uh, that gap on an annual basis for several years. This year, we're actually going to be able to use some of the CARES money to cover uh, that gap. So that's $800,000 to the good towards any shortfall that we may have. ATA, uh, Ann Smith has let us know that um, there are, they don't need the city's payment for the rest of the year. Uh, on the phone, she said that would be three uh, quarterly payments. I think we total have about $127,000 that's dedicated to ATA. And she indicated on the phone that we, she will not need three quarterly payment. So about $108,000 in savings there that she's being offset by federal funds as well. We then dove into operations. Public Works has some savings they've identified. This is a combination of cuts within um, our street side of operations, but also using revenues uh, from other sources to help offset some of our general fund expenses. So he, Rob and his team came up with just over a million dollars, 1.1 in terms of uh, offsetting revenue streams or cuts, as well as the decision early to close the pools for the summer and not offer adult and youth summer programs. Uh, we see a savings of that 1.235 million. Travel for the rest of the year, uh, equated to about $220,000 in savings for the city, as well as our select hiring freeze, which would net out uh, close to $450,000. So all told, right now, uh, we have projected just shy of $4 million in savings and cuts and revenue offsets uh, for 2020. The memo itself talked about an additional three, three and a half. Uh, we have those um, additional cuts that if necessary, we can make. Um, some of those will be a little bit more difficult on the organization and the community. But again, we'll have to kind of wait and see how June, July, August, really through the end of the year, we're gonna be adjusting as we go. It's very difficult to predict just when normal when we will return and really even defining what normal will be in, in the future by way of revenues. The following slides are just again reminders of 
where we are today, how our total budget is split out. Uh, we get to $163 million in 2020 uh, in a variety of ways, comprised of the general funds, special revenues, debt service, and the enterprise funds. One of the highlight, really, the property taxes that go into that $163 million budget and how they're they fall in under the general fund and the debt service. This is a slide that we had in front of the commission uh, at the end of January when we were talking about the point three uh, and the projects associated with it. Again, this is our mill levy broken down, our 49.798, and we subtotal it just under 17 mills for really the things that city management has control over and the city commission levies on behalf of the organization. We have outside agencies and RCPD and library and the library employee benefit fund that obviously comprise of the balance of uh, the 49.798. Brief education on the levy. One mil is really one one thousandth of the total valuation. Manhattan has a value of just over $585 million. One mil then in Manhattan equals about $585,000. We have 156 mills in Manhattan. And this is comprised of not only the city's 49, but the counties, the school districts, and the states. And when we look at our total mills at that 49.798, as I mentioned, it includes PD and the library. We pack those out, that 16.899, as a percentage of the total 156.510 is just under 11% of the total property tax bill that folks see um, late in the year paid in two payment, uh, one or two payments either in December and May. So city services, when we talk about things again that the city management has under its control, when we look at a home $200,000 in value. That has to be taken times 11.5% for a residence. Commercial property is at 25% from a, an assessed valuation. So you take that $200,000 times 11.5%, then you take it times that total mill levy, we just talked about at 156 mills uh, at a 0.156 value, and you get a, a property tax payment of just under $3,600. Again, when we look at that 10.8%, it translates into $388 that homeowner is paying for the city's portion of the bill. And then that equates to $32 a month or a dollar six a day. Same example on the commercial side. And you can see the portion of the city that um, is, again, roughly that 10% of the total, 11%, and then what, it, what we're costing that owner per day. Revenue streams, again, just a snapshot really of the last five to six years, showing a steady amount on sales tax. Uh, prior to 2015, uh, based on the experience of the last 20 years, uh, we saw substantial increases in sales tax. And it's really what's been allowed our community to do a lot of things between 2000 and 2015, just a substantial amount of sales taxes has been realized. But over the last five or six years, it's been fairly flat and it's been difficult to use those revenue streams uh, to do anything in addition or enhancement wise within the, uh, the city's general fund. Franchise fees have stayed fairly flat. We have grown in property taxes. A lot of that has been due to valuation increases as well as modest uh, mill levy increases with the city. And then our bond interest, our property tax supported fund there has, has remained fairly consistent over the last six years as well. So for our 2021 budget, we wanted to really put a focus back on the employees within the organization. Uh, it's, it's difficult to, to talk about really of any of the services that we provide without talking about all the employees that we have. Uh, our cash balances and debt are of concern. We have some uh, looming debt that is going to need some sources 
Uh, it is a big reason why we put the point three on the ballot, knowing those six initiatives were something the community was, was fairly committed to do. But our cash balances, especially in the general fund, are, uh, are woefully inadequate. Uh, when we look at where cash balances are uh, across the state, uh, for our general fund and for the risk that we have associated with all the operations of the city, as well as our CPD, our balance should be over $8 million in our cash balance in the general fund. Right now, uh, we're operating around a $3 million balance, and we were just at $2 million uh, two, three years ago. Uh, so we, we've got some work to do there. And that cash balance is very important. We'll talk about it more on May 26 as we get into the 21 budget, uh, and we'll, we'll bring some examples and some, some logic and rationale behind why we should have a cash balance of that size. Our revenue streams, again, continue to be fairly flat, uh, and, we, and we struggle to do some of the things that we need to do as an organization uh, to move forward and keep up with uh, the demands. So our preview, as I laid out within the, the memo itself, we've had a lot of discussions within the organization about our organizational excellence initiatives, our OEI. Uh, we've advocated for a strategic plan. We could budget and strategize uh, more comprehensively with the commission and the community and, and staff, work towards um, prioritizing just exactly where uh, the revenues we do receive uh, will be placed within the organization. A pay study, uh, the last pay study we did, which we did not implement, was 2013. Uh, the only piece that we implemented was actually moving a certain segment of our workforce up to a minimum level that was recommended by the consultant. It had a very minimal impact. We went ahead and did that, but we did the other suggested uh, in our pay study. So it's it added so, uh, based on that study and where we're at today, just where exactly the market is at, but we'd like to study that and bring back a strategy to implementation uh, moving forward. We have a hurdle in 2021. We have a 27th pay period. Uh, we, we get There's a Friday that falls on January 1st. Um, and obviously then we move through the rest of the year and we end up with 27 pay periods. Uh, it's, you know, step increases are something we've talked about, but this 27th pay period is gonna be another uh, obstacle for us. It, it, it'll range anywhere from 800 to $850,000 across the board uh, impact for the organization. You back out utilities, you can get that back down to a five fifty, six hundred thousand dollar impact. Uh, but it's something that is going to be uh, impactful for twenty one. Some people budgeted for it in twenty. We moved it to twenty one, uh, knowing where we were last year with our budget discussions. Um, there, there could be strategies, and we'll bring those up again on May twenty six on how to address that. Uh, again, fund balances, trying to get to a multi-year strategy. No, you can't get from three million to eight million in one year, but how do we put that, that strategy together? Debt, very similar, multi-year strategy. Don't wanna impose a, a great amount in one year, stretch that out, but have a strategy to how we're going to actually fund that debt, whether that's property taxes, sales tax, or a combination of the both. Clearly, you all have the ability under the lid to work with property taxes. We have to go to a vote if we want to get sales tax involved with future revenue streams. Staffing needs, uh, we continue to have uh, obstacles and challenges, keeping our people at a market rate and competitive. And then in a way we can recruit and retain our employees. So we have a number of promotions and additional staffing needs that we have in the organization, as well as three new rec centers for 2021. And we've been talking about that staffing and operating for multiple years now. We need to put together a budget in 21 that accommodates that growth. Just a quick review of our $163 million and what that really means. We have 
450 full-time or part-time people within the operational departments and administrative departments. Some of these departments haven't grown uh, for several years, and we have some real challenges in our administrative departments. Um, we've been able to grow in some of our operational departments, but our administrative, our supporting staff in finance and HR and legal, and even our clerk's office have really remained the same for a number of years. Um, they're challenged, they're stressed, and we, we've developed uh, a real need in those areas uh, from, a, from a personnel standpoint to support the rest of this organization. Our payroll, just over $22 million, and that's for everybody, um, both utility and non-utility. Seven to 800 seasonal staff members. Um, when you think about a $163 million business in the community with 450 employees, it's substantial in Manhattan. And when you think about the operating, the oversight, uh, the risk associated with all the, we have 22 facilities, uh, the multi-million dollars we have in infrastructure and equipment and the maintenance that's required and the oversight is, is intense and it's becoming more and more intense every day. Uh, we, we have a, a lot of loose ends and the, and the management that's required across the board here uh, is increasing daily. So as we prepare for that 21 budget, that strategic plan and pay study, clearly at the top of the list for our internal organizational excellence initiative. Uh, again, reiterating uh, such a focus on retaining and recruiting employees. Um, we've done a, a number of internal surveys and we have found here lately that half of our employees have been with us for five years or less. That is a substantial difference than five, 10, 15 years ago. Half of our employees have been with us for less than five years. It's an indicative, uh, it's an indicator that suggests there's a lot of turnover. And with that turnover comes expectations when people come from other places as to what you're gonna offer. Uh, younger people are moving around more. They're looking for better opportunities. And in order for us to recruit that talent and keep that talent, we need to keep up with what others are doing. And that strategic plan and that pay study will help us get into some of those categories and, and strategies moving forward. Sales tax revenue, We've been fl flat for the past five years, and it's really stressed out this organization. Again, when you look at 2000 through 2015, we had great increases in sales tax. It allowed us to do a lot of things from an organizational standpoint that just hasn't been there in the last five years. You know, we've, we've put a lot of emphasis on economic development and job creation, but that growth just hasn't been there. And we're not seeing the increases in sales tax as a result of more people and more income and more shopping here in Manhattan. We're, we're seeing a, a, a real static line there. Um, it's impacted our ability to, to keep up with that demand and services. And then obviously the, the reluctance to raise property taxes mixes in there and it, it just generates an environment that hasn't changed a whole lot in, in the last four to five years. Uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're short or behind in staffing. Our technology is lacking behind as well. Uh, we're having issues with separation of duties uh, and dated policies that are impacting uh, multiple departments within the organization. Cash balances, again, on the property tax side and debt, we'll, you'll hear those things over and over through the next couple months as we get to uh, a budget that we can approve in, in August. Um, we need that reliable revenue stream for critical operations. Uh, you hate to use these pandemics and floods and natural disasters as uh, excuses, but they're real. They hit us and financially, uh, they can cause hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in um, impacts to what you anticipated in terms of delivering those services to the community. And just in summary, we wanted to position the city not only for today, not only for tomorrow, but the future. And we have to get beyond looking at an annual budget, and we need to look beyond that year and where we want Manhattan to go. 
Uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, I think we do a, a pretty good job of looking at those bigger projects, those multi-million, but we have a lot of maintenance. We have a lot of things that we need to take care of. Uh, they can turn into white elephants really quick. And that white elephant is when something gets beyond uh, the maintenance that's required and now it costs uh, actually more to try to repair than to do something new. Uh, we need to stay steady and consistent with that investment in equipment and facilities and infrastructure. We need to become competitive in the marketplace for talent to recruit and retain. That's, that's pay, that's technology, and that's benefits. And just that financial stability with adequate cash balances and a debt strategy that can lead to that solid bond and debt rating and leave us in a position where if we do have a natural disaster, we do have a pandemic, we do have something occur within the community, we can continue without missing a beat to provide those services and provide the expectations that not only you as commissioners, but the community has for the government. And it's in times like these, the floods, the tornadoes, the pandemics, when a lot of people look back to the government, to provide the services that they normally do at the same level that they always have. And that's why you build those balances. That's why you strategize and put your organization in the best possible position to, uh, to react to those things. Last year, we had quite a bit of flooding and the threat of flooding. And we spent a ton of time. Uh, I asked some of our departments, had we flooded, had the spill gates not held back that water, had they had to raise them, what kind of impact would that have had on opportunity? It was, it was substantial, substantial. The amount of time that fire, that public works, that utilities would have dedicated towards that Northview area adjacent to the Big Blue. Uh, we dodged a real bullet there. And even in that, we spent uh, close to a uh, million dollars on a couple of sinkholes and lost revenues because the weather uh, didn't allow, or the weather prohibited people from really needing to irrigate their lawns. So we had less revenue in the water fund, but and we all spent out money on sinkholes. So it did have an impact financially on us. And those are, those are unforeseen things. So we need those, those approaches uh, to be part of what we do uh, from a strategic standpoint. So happy to take any questions at this point, commissioners. Uh, really just looking for feedback and conversation with you this evening. Thanks, Jason. Uh, can we hear questions for Jason? Okay, Jason, I have a couple of questions for you while other commissioners chime in. Um, are we collecting already on the um, town center, the CID? Yes. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, we about? have made, they have made uh, almost $5 million in improvements uh, within the, the facility itself. So they're documenting that with us. Their 0.75 increase in sales tax has been in place uh, for several months now. and. We receive that money, we keep 10% of that increase, and then we pick 90% based on the costs and expenses that they've incurred on site. I think to date, we're between three and $400,000. We've reimbursed them. Uh, but again, they've spent four and a half and $5 million in, re in uh, improvements that are eligible. Thank you. Um, I have a few more questions, but I will wait until everybody asks theirs. Uh, Jason, you had one of the question? slides yeah, where you Mark. talked about the, the level 11 million to 12 million in sales tax. Um, but I noticed the property tax and I, I assume that's just the percent for operations. The last six years has pretty much doubled from 1.9 million to 3.9 million. If you can find that slide there, that blue one there, I think. Yep. So, I was going to say, I my my guess my question is, if it looks like we've increased our property tax revenue significantly, 50% in six years. Um, 
we're doubling it. I mean, 100% increase in the, the six years you have listed there. Um, but we, but the city staff wants us to continue to look at trying to generate more income from that source. Is that kind of your thinking? Yeah, it, and it's more of a, a stability comment, Mark, when we're so reliant on sales tax and we're operating in an environment that is heavily dependent on K-State, heavily dependent on Fort Riley. When you think about deployments and you think about things that impact student enrollment, when we talk about that 11 million in sales tax that can be easily impacted by behavior and economic situations versus your property tax are traditionally very stable. So it's, it's really a stable, a stability issue in my mind, getting us to a cash balance where if you do have drops in revenue, you can sustain that for multiple years. And I think we got two things working against us right now. We've got sales tax that are very susceptible, but we have low cash balances in order to react in the event we have events like we've had last year and this year. Um, and GFA, which is Governmental Finance Officers Association, gives some real guidance on where communities like us should be because we are uh, and we do have a higher risk for sales tax um, declines just based on the heavy reliance of the state and federal government around us. Yeah, I, I, I can understand that. My, well, I guess my point is I can understand why people are squealing about their property taxes if they've essentially doubled in the last six years. And I know, um, you know a lot of that's going to go to the school district for their bond issues and, and the county's raised their property tax noticeably too. And, and so that's, I can understand yeah, if my property tax has doubled in six years, why people are complaining about that. And I realize that that is the most stable source to go, but, but obviously there has to be a balance. And I know we've, we've tried to keep the mill levy the same, but with the valuation and such continue to increase, um, people are still paying a lot more in property taxes than they were, but yeah, it's obviously a balancing act. And so we'll, we'll keep looking at things. And I know we've tried to raid various other places for money so that we wouldn't have to raise property taxes more, um, but it is is uh, when the property taxes have doubled, they're, they're going faster than than people can sort of keep up with them. That's it. So that that doubling, um, it, it's a combination, and and we'll talk about this more. Valuation can go up, and the the mill levy can stay the same. Uh, that can increase. So you can have sprawl development or redevelopment, which, which takes property either off the tax rolls or at a, a significantly lower value. So you get development in the community that can raise our taxes, our revenue receipts without necessarily doubling your home taxes, if that makes sense. So when we have growth in Manhattan and we see things from a property tech perspective, increase we realize benefits from a revenue standpoint so i just throw that out there because it's not it's not necessarily i've doubled your taxes but the community is at least growing in a way and the levy has increased to to make that two million dollar jump from one nine to three nine Jason, yeah, I'm gonna um, what just is the projected bond okay. mm -hmm. oh, Go ahead, Linda. Yeah. Well, freeze? I wondered if you can't have a projection yet on. Pardon? Okay. Uh, Jason, I was asking if you have a projection yet on the bond and interest for 2021. We you you show an amount there for 2020. I wondered, is it going to go up significantly, or is it going to stay pretty flat? 
I'm pleased to see it reduced. That's good news. So the, the bond and interest isn't projected to go up substantially for 21. Nope. But you do have a substantial amount of temporary notes out that uh, are going to come on in 23, 24, and 25. So that's where the strategy needs to come into play um, for those projects. Uh, if, in, in every couple months, we get a debt and cash management report, and I think it makes it in its way into the monthly report. But you can see our, our temp notes have increased uh, substantially, and that permanent debt will be three and a half years away uh, from the most recent temp notes we've issued. So there's a, and it, it's really the, you know, a lot of the discussion around the point three, a lot of the discussion about uh, EcoDevo, whether it's a renewal or replacement, helping out that bond and interest fund to keep that property tax mill levy level is, is the goal. And that's what we continue to talk about uh, with you and the community about doing. Gwen had a question. But I have a question. I want to comment on you had a slide there with key points to prepare the 2021 budget, you know, strategic outlook, and you wanted some feedback on that. So I've got a few notes on that. Your your first point was a strategic plan and pay study, and you talked about retention, recruiting employees. I understand all that, but the when that decision was made, the um, situation was a lot different. You know, you know, right now. The government has taken the initiative in shutting down the economy, which basically destroys all our revenue streams. So essentially, when you look at the pay study, it needs to not be done for 2021. And we can't do step increases and we can't do raises because that's the majority of where all our money goes. So you, you've got to take the tough choice right now and just say that's not going to happen. Now, is that going to affect retention? No, because we still have jobs. There's a lot of people out there that aren't going to have jobs you're going to be pushing a 20 percent unemployment rate not going to have a problem recruiting people because they're going to be out there scrambling we got businesses that have already we've already lost to my count five businesses in town they folded up shop permanently you know already and so the the economic disaster that we are facing is going to continue and so to me that's an unrealistic goal can't be achieved and you got to put that on hold and everybody that works here needs to understand that's not going to happen just like when we had the discussion at the law board, it's uh, sorry there won't be any step increases next year for our CPD because the money's not there. And you made that point clear in the property tax uh, collections just for this year, that that mill levy supports it and the money's just not there. And fortunately, the majority of the uh, people that work for the government, they've retained their jobs. So they've got income and they're not quite in as bad a shape. So that's my thought on that. That one's sort of like a big no. Uh, sales tax revenue, uh, you make a good point. We put all this money into economic development and the sales tax rates haven't gone up. And so that tells me that we need to relook the whole economic development concept. And I know we got region reimagined, which I'm still having a hard time putting my hands around, put some investment in there to try to change it. But we're not getting the results out of economic development that we should. I'm still interested in uh, you know, having that economic development tax uh, redone, so it includes the Pot County side. But part of that discussion has got to involve this particular issue of, wait a minute, it didn't generate increased sales tax. It, it, it caused other things to happen. So maybe that money should be redirected into some different piles. And one of those might be your cash balances that some of that money could be put there to take care of crisis. Now the operational services shortfall, and, and I can clearly see that one. And that, that's a tough one because, you know, if you're not gonna, you know, recruit more people and pay more, how do you address that? I would recommend a real hard look at, you know, what I call process management, that those offices need to look at the processes and is there any waste in there that they can cut out? And, and I believe there is some there. I won't get into details, but there's, there's, if, if you have the people closest to the process, look at what they're doing. There's a lot of wasteful stuff there. And, and, and I've repeatedly mentioned just a couple of them in admin. 
you know, repeatedly sending me, you know, three emails telling me my cat needs a vaccination, getting three uh, letters telling me to get my uh, sprinkler system inspected, you know, and, and all that's a waste of money. And, and we need to do something about that. And then last on the, on the property taxes, I agree, we need a long-term plan to take some money, some amount, and move it over into reserve fund so you can keep it for that. But as far as a property tax increase for 2021, you know, absolutely no. We got to start the discussion on the budget with a mill levy of zero, which still will increase the amount of money, as Mark had us all pointed out. Because if the value of your house goes up, your taxes will still go up, even if we have a flat mill levy. But that's got to be our starting point. And then from there, it might have to be rolled back, but it can't be rolled up. You have to take the same approach that uh, the RCPD director did. He's going to bring back to the law board some options, and they start with a flat budget and go down from there, not up. And that's a lot different than what we've done in years past. But, but I believe that's what we have to do until we see this economy in Kansas open back up and start generating things. Because we can't live off of uh, you know federal government checks and we can't keep the entire population not working and expect to be successful. Thanks, Wynn. Wynn is a, is a response that I would just offer. Um, we're in uncertain times, and I, I don't disagree with a lot of your comments. There is a tremendous amount of revenue that we collect annually, and we provide a tremendous amount of services. I believe that strategic plan could actually help us figure out some of these issues and reprioritize where we, where we use our existing money. So I'm, I'm not sitting here saying, raise your taxes, I'm saying let's evaluate what we do and reprioritize so we put money where we need to put money and we take away money from areas that are lower on the totem pole. And that strategic plan, we may be forced to do anyway because if 2021 or 2020 is a lot less revenue, we're gonna be doing this regardless. And then 2021 comes along and we're nowhere near where we thought we would be, we're gonna be doing it regardless. I would rather do it with you and with the community. So when we make decisions like don't open the pool and don't operate those rec programs, that's actually in that fourth tier at the bottom of the list of things that we can cross off that everybody is like, yep, that's at the bottom, it's not critical, we need to eliminate that versus the controversy and, and the, well, what is the priority? Where would we spend money? Where wouldn't we spend money? And, and you know, I, I, I recognize a lot of that. It, that's on us, that's our decision administratively, but a strategic plan can make it very visible and, and educate everybody as a document and a resource we can point to. Yeah, I, I understand that, Jason. I, I, I was more talking about the pay study part. That, that, that part's gotta go, the strategic plan and. And even some of those OEI initiatives can be done at low cost if, if, if uh, local people do it, you know, in a certain way. So I, I don't really take, take issue with that. I, I get the strategic plan. That's sort of like, what do you do with economic development? You know, how do you figure out how to get uh, your, your cash balances up? Where's that money come from? You know, how are you going to improve what's going on in uh, operational services without raising it? So I don't have an issue with that. But when I was saying completely eliminate one thought process, and that is this idea of paying somebody to do another pay study and, and assume we're gonna have step increases and COLAs and all that. And I think that uh, idea has got to be put to rest. Yeah. So, so Jason, um, you know, I think as we, we didn't expect the pandemic to be where it is right now, and it's not even done yet. So that's the problem I think I'm having as well. I think when this initially started, I'm usually the first one in favor of Step and Cola and all of that because I feel like that impacts your pension in the long run, it impacts capers, whatever else you might have. But unfortunately, the state is also going to have a $1.2 billion shortfall. And I don't know what kind of resources we're gonna get from the state and what kind of cuts they're going to make next year themselves, or even this year. Uh, a lot of unknowns, such as Kansas State University. I don't know if they're going to have on-campus 
campus classes or if it's going to be a hybrid form, uh, what that's going to do to our rental properties and how they're going to pay for their property taxes if that's uh, decreasing. So with all of those unknowns, as far as the pay study, I, I'm not in favor of that for this year. Um, maybe next year or even the year after that, because this is going to be something we're going to face challenges for the next two or three years. I think it's a good thing that we do have a lot of construction happening in the city of Manhattan. I don't see that everywhere else. So that's going to increase our property valuations and Kansas State University is probably gonna continue building as well. So that's still gonna help us and USD 383. But I'm a little hesitant until I know where some of the funding, uh, if we're going to get any funding out of those um, CARES Act or any other stimulus packages that they're working on, that's going to help us with some of the decision process, just like they did for the airport as well as uh, Adibus. Um, like I said, COVID-19 is going to last a little while. Um, the shortfalls that are happening uh, at the state level, I don't know what that's going to mean to the universities. Right now, they're not increasing their tuition as far as I know, but I don't know what that means for enrollment, and we are very dependent on that. Um, I think the, um, can you go back to your strategy slide for just a minute? I was looking at it and then I lost it. Um, not the strategy slide, the questions that we were gonna be looking at. That Yes, that one, thank you. Um, I think the, um, recruitment and retainment. So one of the things I think if we have, if people have a job right now, that's what they're looking for. There are so many people that are being let go and nobody, you know, as good as it might be that they're getting an unemployment check, that doesn't last forever. So having job security is key right now. So I think that's a place where if we are losing people, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more that we can probably hire from that pack as well. Um, economic development, job creation, we still need to continue that process. I don't know where we are going to be uh, even collecting sales tax. I don't know when we're going to have conferences and conventions. I don't know what kind of events we're going to have. Uh, if K-State is not, going or any events are not going to have spectators in the stadium, we're gonna lose sales tax revenue. So I don't know how all of that looks. I wanna see those, that dire forecast before we make some of these, um, uh, what is it, uh, commitments to what that looks like. I need to see the uh, absolute worst scenario. If there are no football games and no basketball games, what does that mean? If we don't have conferences for a while, what does that mean? I, I need to see all of that as opposed to a 50% or 10% or whatever it might be. Uh, I think we need to, what the pandemic has really showed me is uh, the dire need for technology uh, if we need to invest money uh, in HR and all of these other areas, technology seems to be a place where we absolutely make sure, we have to be sure we are uh, up to grade and updated in all of those areas. If some of our staff decides to still work remotely, then they should have that choice to work remotely and still get the job done. And that's where technology is gonna be such a key uh, piece to even recruitment. Uh, the pandemic had shown that you can still be a productive employee even if you're working remotely and you have children at home because we, we don't look into childcare and some of these things. So I would like to look at some of those operational services and where we want to invest and prioritize is that. Of course, that goes back to your strategic plan that you were talking about. Uh, property taxes, property valuations are going to increase. Um, I want to have a clear idea of also not just the bond and interest, but what the debt is right now and what do we see in the next two or three years. I think Manhattan is going to do well. Uh, it's well situated for um, a prosperous economy in the next two or three years, but at the same time, uh, we need to invest appropriately and make sure um, the USD 383 bond initiative for the uh, schools um, is huge. And even if we increase our property taxes very nominally, it's going to feel a lot, we're going to get blamed for all of that. So I think we need to have a clear idea of what the um, property taxes are going to look like. They said the USD 383s reduces after a couple of years. There's a reduction process in play there. Um, but again, I think for the strategic plan, there's a lot of unknowns and I just wanna have a clear idea of what it is and still keep our community essential services moving along um, in the best capacity possible and still recruiting more businesses to come here. But the entire nation is in this gap. 
uh, Johnson County and Sedgwick County received millions of dollars uh, from the CARES Act. And if you're a 500,000 500, population or more, you received a little bit of money. Only two counties fall into that. So we need to look at how to work with our senators and our congressional delegation to see what more funds we can get for our community. Otherwise, we're working with a, a negative slate right now. You talked about property taxes for RCPD. Um, I don't know what kind of money the county is also going to generate. We'll probably get more of those numbers after today, after May 10th. Uh, so if the county is low on also collection of property taxes and they give money to also to RCPD, RCPD is completely run on property taxes. That's a discussion we need to have in it in our governmental meeting uh, with our with uh, with law board as well as um, uh, the county and the city. We need to figure out what that budget is going to look like because that means we're all going to have shortfalls. Uh, so those are just just my take on that. Did you want to say something? I was just fortunately what we're hearing from a property tax perspective is not a very high delinquency. But as you can see from Wichita State's report, 20% drops in retail. If we were talking 20% drops in property tax, um, yeah. yeah, things would change in, in everywhere dramatically. Uh, so, you know, we're waiting to see if people are able to pay their property taxes and do on time. Uh, but earlier reports, that's that's looking fairly um, positive towards people paying their, their taxes. Uh, but clearly retail patterns have, have changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. and, and then again, we may not see the impact in May. We may see it in January or December or January, where if this, this, it, this has only been going on for a couple of months, you know, four to eight, six months might be even more devastating. So we still need to forecast that piece of it as well. So those are just my thoughts. I know they were kind of, um, all over the place, um, but there's still so many unknowns, but I'm glad you're putting this in front of us. Um, Aaron, I didn't hear from you. Did you want to add anything? Sure, thank you. Um, I would I would just uh, initially, I think this is a macro view. This is good because there are so many un unknowns. Um, when it comes to that pay study, I, I agree with uh, the previous comments. When it comes to the both the reality, and I think it's better to to get it out there now um, than wait. Is I I my thinking aligns um, on that pay increase or step uh, with the same as Commissioner Butler that we need to start it from a position of uh, here we are at zero and with uh, maintaining what we have and look at options in case things are worse um that's the ceiling i have in my mind i don't see it either i don't see it as a, a viable option to to be discussing any kind of increases um while people are unemployed and we're we have so many services that we are limited in what we can offer so that's just where I stand on that. Um, with property taxes, it, we, we, we hold up on one side that we are, um, we're kind of proud that our property tax portion is, is, is not a huge portion. And so we hide behind that in some ways as the city saying that it's 10.8%. But then on the other side of that, point is that our vulnerability of uh, being so dependent on sales tax and the other revenue um, has put us in a position where we we see ourselves a little bit more extended in some ways um, than maybe we can afford to be. So given all of that, uh, for, I, at one point I saw the number 44% uh, of our operating budget is, is sales tax dependent. We're in a pretty uncertain time right and um, I want us to build uh, to be resilient without giving up um, some of the things that some of the we if we have to make cuts we have to make cuts but I would rather see us find efficiencies um, and try to find ways that we can improve this structure um, that we have as a system in a macro sense uh, to be more resilient if we have to deal with this 
and maybe we will have to deal with this in, in the coming years. Uh, our, we got dinged really hard, and I think I, I suspect we will be dinged pretty hard, and I think we can bounce back, but we can't be playing this roller coaster back and forth. And so this, this crisis presents the opportunity to realign some of the ways we do things, rethink how what, what we're investing in, um, with tax dollars and how we deliver services, how we how we do a lot of things. Um, we don't want to miss this time to try to go back to the way things were, but also keep uh, the expectation that we're going to, this is not going to be easy, it's going to be tough, and, and nobody should be anticipating any kind of um, pay increases during this period of time. Jason, do you know um, for the, I'm sorry, did you want to say something to Aaron? I just kind of butted in there. Oh, I, I started to say something. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Okay, uh, I was just wondering, since the transient guest tax is going to be totally in the toilet, what parts of the general fund, is there anything that's going to, that's going to affect us? I, obviously, they, they pay a lot, of, they pay some to Discovery Center and a whole lot to the chamber with that. Is there some part of, of that lack of transient guest tax going to affect kind of the general fund in particular at all? Yeah, there. Um, so we moved transient guest tax out of the Discovery Center and put it oh. in a bond and interest. Okay. So we flip flopped a, a payment. So Special Park and Recreation actually transfers money over to the general fund for the operation at Discovery Center. But now transient guest tax actually help pay or make a payment on the synthetic turf out at Annenberg for the soccer field and the uh, Twin Oaks Main one through four infields. So that's about $260,000 annually uh, that comes out of TGT towards that debt service. We also fund ABA, DMI, MATC, and the Wolf House, um, not MATC, MAC, uh, Art Center. Um, out of transient guest tax, that's about $187,000 a year. That goes towards those folks. So that 187, um, we only have two quarters payments, and quite honestly, that may be all we get uh, for the for the 2020 year. Uh, we've made two quarter payments to everybody. So right now, they're they have all the revenue they anticipated, but for the last half of the year, it will be impacted. Um, the other one, obviously, is the CVB contract, uh, and we talked to. Karen a little bit about that, but that's that basically rounds out the use. We we do send 90 grand to the state for star bonds, um, and again we we have half of that. We set aside some money for the conference center expansion uh, because we increased that transient guest tax rate uh, about a year and a half ago. So we've collected some revenues there, um, and that'll hurt us on buying down that debt that we anticipated doing. Okay, thanks. I might just add that there are some potential possibilities that some of those groups could be funded through some CARES Act funding or potentially through some of our CDBG funds. So uh, as we look at uh, alternatives, uh, uh, as we've lost some of those revenue seams, I think the toughest thing for the TGT is going to be the forecast for 21, quite frankly, uh, and how slowly or, or, or quickly things will ramp up in the entertainment and meeting business. So, um, because, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks have certainly cut their travel costs out and, uh, less likely to have a lot of face-to-face -face meetings. And so those are some key factors that, uh, we certainly will continue to, to watch and, and develop, uh, options and scenarios for. Yeah. You know, Ron, I think that's exactly what I'm hearing. You know, when I'm when I listen to all these sporting events, regardless if it's um, professional or uh, from college and universities, as they consider their um, schedules to decrease, fewer games and fewer competitive uh, athletics going on, but there are, the constant needs seems to be no no spectators. So if you don't have spectators um, and you don't have conferences and you don't have conventions, that reduces uh, airplane, uh, airport, our travel um, budget uh, as far as revenue. 
and it also reduces the transient guest tax revenue and uh, sales tax revenue because they can't spend they don't need to spend their money and i don't know where we stand on high school sports i don't know if they're planning on traveling state to state or having competitive play there so I think those are the some some of the things that we need to look at a uh, worst case scenario and certainly they're you know best case I guess in these circumstances I just don't know because that's where our sales tax is going to come from if we when we talk about a family going somewhere for a football game or for their child to participate in any a athletic event we what what's been normally said is they spend close to three hundred dollars that weekend that's a lot of loss for each of our uh, communities. So I think that's that's one of the places we need to look at. We may end up making more cuts in the long run than fewer cuts. And one thing we want to per personnel is where we would be saving the most by cutting. But that should be actually the last, last place I want to see because most of those people are very essential to what we have right now. We've already cut out the seasonal staff. Um, uh, it's just very difficult because it's just to still May and I don't know, summer, nothing's happening in summer. That's three months of lost revenue. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure uh, we've seen the worst yet. And I want to see that worst case scenario before we put anything else to buy for a study or any, just like we did away with the housing study. I think maybe the pay study, uh, we should kind of put that on, on hold for now. A strategic plan is something I would be in favor of depending on what exactly that means. Sure, and, and I think uh, obviously we've done a lot of things that delayed and suspended uh, a lot of those expenditures uh, to put us in a position to, to have some of those, those, those decisions. And as we move forward, uh, the circumstances that we're in will, will determine what some of our next steps will be. And then having multiple scenarios uh, to go down will be important. Uh, whether or not uh, some of these suspensions are temporary in nature or whether they become more permanent in nature. And that's, Jason alluded to some of the, some of the exercises uh, in a strategic plan when we'll determine, uh, you know, what are some of those programs that uh, we've uh, offered over the last two decades uh, through city services. And, and it, it really needs to be uh, a really somewhat of a community exercise as to what are we willing as a community to no longer do and is that a, a one or two year uh, deflection or is it something that's more permanent uh, so that we can redirect uh, some of those revenue streams uh, to more important uh, and critical programs and or services so uh, that that gut check and internal look is going to be critical for uh, how we how we fund things I, I do I would ask that uh, you keep a little bit of an open mind for uh, creativity uh, in our ability to be able to fund some of those things that uh, uh, we, we had a goal towards doing if, it, if we could do it in ways that, uh, that don't increase that bottom line. Um, and that may mean that other components sacrifice significantly in order to make that happen. And those are just I would just encourage you to, to keep an open mind to those potential possibilities for us to, for us to look at. And, and we've talked uh, internally about some uh, strategies to be able to, to do that, uh, that create sacrifice among our employees, but at the same time, uh, maybe a year or two down the road, uh, they don't sacrifice their necessary position uh, by making that uh, that voluntary sacrifice uh, in the short run, uh, that they don't fall back down the hill uh, to work their way back up, but they can maintain that position or maybe even climb there. But the ultimate impact is, is even or less uh, because we've made tough decisions in other places. Right. Uh, Mayor, I have a couple of questions. Jason, what is the cost for the, the pay study that we've been talking about? Do we have you know an estimate? And does yeah. that mean, just because we do a pay study doesn't mean we have to implement it, right? Correct. Okay. The, the pay study estimate has been about $75,000 estimate. Okay. The, str the strategic plan, we think we could do between $100,000 and $125,000. Okay. Um, next time we're together, I'll bring you some examples of what Lawrence has done because I, I really like their four tiers and they kick 
uh, critical into tier one, uh, and then they get into tier two, tier three, and tier four. And the comment in the document is there will always be a tier four. You will always have some level of program or service that is just at tier four. You can, and, and, and if you were to address multiple in tier four and you redid your strategic plan, you would still have things in tier four. It will always be, you just have less everywhere else. So we'll bring you some examples. Again, I think it's an opportunity for us to really look at the way we do things and use existing revenues to prioritize into areas that we need to uh, invest in. I was, uh, uh, I, I'm, I really feel like we need the information that you'll be providing at our next works budget session because we don't have enough, and this is so new, we are, you know, we don't even know the revenue for March and April, and so this is all speculation, but we are uh, cruising up to a, uh, a budget deadline and so we've got to an anticipate but I think we have a little bit of time here to have a very measured um, kind of approach. I was encouraged to see your um, figures uh, with regard to the, the at least the general fund at, based on percentages and I think that that's going to be necessary um, I, I really do. I think we have to be able to to uh, have scenarios for depend uh, that's dependent upon the revenue that may or may not come in. Uh, that's just a, a very practical thing we have to be doing. So I'm uh, and I, I appreciated I, uh, Ron's information a month ago or a couple of weeks ago was that he was not it wasn't going to plan to do across the board cuts that it was going to be more strategic so as time goes on I think I would like to see the plan for you know what if we have to cut our total operations by 20 percent what does what would be the things that we would have to sacrifice uh, and if if it were so bad that we had to sacrifice 25 percent what would you as the professional staff recommend to us that uh, and so I believe you would be recommending some total program elimination in that some, those, some of those scenarios so uh, uh, rather than just sitting here imagining tonight I really think that we just need more information and uh, uh, more uh, discussion so and I'm not totally if, I, if, if the pay study is necessary to bring efficiency if the um, strategic plan seems to me we could put off a pay study for a year but the strategic plan may be the exact kind of thing we do in order to figure out where some of these cuts are because you know uh, Ron it, it was on uh, your burden that you um, you know uh, cut all pr uh, recreation programming for the summer, including the pools. And, um, you know, there's been some wincing <laughs> in the community about not having the pools this year. And, but that had to be an immediate decision and an immediate kind of, of uh, 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 way to react to the lack of revenue. And or be, be, the reaction to COVID and the uh, what's happening in the whole country. Um, so we need to. Um, uh, there, there just may be some more programs like that that have to um, be cut at least for this year. And I, I really think we want to look at some revenue generators also. And I am uh, continue to be convinced that. Uh, we ought to look at um, collecting the short-term rental, uh, transient guest tax on short-term rentals, um, instead of the <clears throat> the B and I think the B and Bs are under control. It's the but the short-term rental business is getting to be so big across the country that. Uh, it's not fair for the hotels and the B&Bs and you know we need a level playing field and so 
I'm, uh, I, I think that's a, a place we have to look to. There are people converting apartments and uh, um, over to, to this uh, Airbnb, that's a, a proprietary name, but it's um, short-term rentals is the generic term, but that, uh, that's a source, an additional source of transient guest tax that we're letting sift through our fingers like sand. So I, I don't know, you would have some recommendations perhaps on some other areas that are, I don't consider that punitive. I think that is us being smart. And uh, so anyway, I'd like to look at more, at, at all of us, start thinking about more ideas like that, that would be, that are logical. I Thank agree. you. Uh -huh. Thank you. What did uh make one other comment on, on that strategic plan I guess and I was saying I don't have a problem with us looking at that I wasn't expecting us to pay a consultant a bunch of money to do it it sounds like that that's where you're headed uh, you know every place I've worked uh, the strategic plan was done by the management uh, that's what management gets paid to do so I, I don't know why we can't create our own strategic plan and forego that cost uh, you know I, I have confidence that the guys closest to the issue which is the management staff you have in place could do a better job than a consultant, actually. And at least that's what I used to teach when I taught, you know, process management and TQM classes. And that's been my experience that uh, sometimes the guys you got in place are smarter than any consultant anyway. So I'd like to see us head in that direction. There was some talk about uh, the transit guest tax. And of course, clearly the numbers are going to indicate a huge drop in that. And I think what that means in the 2021 budget discussion is that you really got to target that money to, to the chamber, CVB, and the two business districts because they're the ones going to help us bring this economy back. And the Wolf House and the Manhattan, uh, you know, Art Center needs to consider getting zero. And and now that's going to be tough. But we've got outside agencies that want about a million dollars a year from the city, and that money's not there this year. And so they're going to take a real hard look at that because we've been dedicating close to a mill to that. Now, now, I like the idea if you know if it can if it can be creative and some of that CARES money can take care of ATA and stuff like that. Uh, that's fine. Uh, the other thing, and, and I may be wrong on this, just uh, my own personal survey, but uh, I think the special alcohol fund may end up with an increase this year, simply because the liquor stores were essential, and their profits went up immensely the past month. So we may see an uptick there, which indirectly means. Parks and Rec might get more money from that fund than usual because that gets split three ways. Now, I have no clue what the numbers would be. It'd be nice if uh, the state could give us some indication of that because that might uh, help you maybe a little bit, uh, you know, with the planning on that. And, and then the other, the other concerns, uh, I've gotten a number of, uh, you know, emails, as Linda mentioned, people concerned about the pools. And I don't know if it's possible, uh, depending upon if things... Uh, turn more optimistic to maybe open one of them up later in the summer for a period of time. I don't know if that's possible, but a contingency plan would be nice. Uh, the, the other thing I've gotten some uh, concerns on, well, what about the water parks, the playgrounds, you know, what's our, what's our plan for that? And I'm sure that if the pools are closed then the splash park is going to be full of kids and also Blue Earth Plaza, and so we're going to have to look real hard at what happens there. If we open those, they're going to be, I think they'll just be packed with people. And so a, a contingency needs to be put in place for that. And then, then I've got some concerns over the library. You know, when we talk about cutting the police department budget because there might be not enough money. The library's got six mills. They're still closed. I haven't really seen a good plan on, you know, what they're going to do to open. I know they've got some concerns there, but, uh, that's six mills. I'd like to have the library present us something on, you know, what's their game plan here on getting that back into operation because it's a nice, uh, you know, chunk of the money. I don't think they've furloughed anybody. And so, you know, they need to have a better plan for what they're going to do. So I know we got a lot of moving parts and uh, I appreciate the work uh, the staff's doing. This is, uh, you know, a tough one. And I do like uh, what you said, Ron, about uh, innovation, you know, <laughs> any way we can do something creative to, to, to move some of those uh, money piles that the federal government is distributing and get them to the right places with a, with a proper priority, uh, I'm 100% for that. So appreciate the work uh, everyone's doing, but 
you know, we got to pay for the police, we got to pay for the fire, and we got to keep the water department open. Those are my top three, you know, for the city. Thanks. Uh, Ron, can any of the CARES money be used in 2021, or does it all have to be used in 2020? So they all seem to be coming with some different rules. Um, obviously, we, when we talked about the airport money that we got from the FAA, that carries into the, actually, I think we can carry that in for five years uh, if we need to. It won't last that long, if, if the way the things are going. Um, the CDBG, uh, we can reprioritize both the 2019 and the 2020 funds. Again, it's got qualification aspects to how we use it. But uh, so I think there will be some parameters for the CARES money that will carry into next year, certainly. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was going to say I, the library will be opening. They do have a plan. Um, it's very good, and uh, they're going to. I think they're going to be opening up next week. Uh -huh. So they work very hard on a plan where it would be um, public health, um, uh, taking into concerns about public health as well as having a library open. So it's gonna be a phased process for them as well, but there will be open. But it is a good discussion to have. I'm on the library board, so I will bring it up at their next meeting. I think it's um, next week or probably the week after that. Uh, either way. Um, I know that in Topeka, the committees, there are several committees meeting this week. So it'd be good to listen in to see if they're going to be reprioritizing anything for this year or for next year. Uh, the appropriations committee is meeting. I think the uh, Ways and Taxation, all of these other committees are meeting uh, this week and it's uh, all Zoom meetings. So we can certainly watch them or have staff or somebody watch and take notes to see if anything is gonna be impacted because they are gonna to have to make some cuts. They are gonna to have to shuffle those funds around and uh, think about next year's revenue sources or lack of revenue sources. Um, I think the pools decision was a really good decision. Uh, it's better to um, not wait till June or July, like you said, for staffing hires. And also if a lifeguard has to do CPR or mouth to mouth resuscitation, um, that's gonna be difficult for a lifeguard's call if you're gonna put a young kid at, uh, at risk for anything. Uh, and a lot of other communities are following the same lead, even though we were the first ones that did it and we got a lot of um, uh, concerns and emails uh, about the decision. I think a lot of communities are following the same decision within the state of Kansas as well as outside, but more importantly in Kansas, they're following the same lead. We know that Heartland, uh, uh, the Heartland Stampede canceled, Wamigos July 4th has canceled, and Sundown Salute has canceled in Junction City. So those are big events, which would have been great revenue sources for TD, uh, for transient guest tax, as well as just sales tax. So those are big events that happen in the summer. Again, I don't know what fall events are gonna look like, especially when we talk about sports. So I'm very, very concerned about not just the transient guest tax, but the sales tax as well. And it would be good to have a few scenarios to what that might look like. I think the idea about looking at short-term rentals is a really good one. And um, uh, Ron uh, and Jason, did you have to, as we think about opening up some of our facilities and bringing back some employees, um, back into our uh, offices, are there extra expenditures that you have to consider um, just as safety precautions or is there anything different you need to do or do they just come back? Uh, I'm just talking about the expenditure piece, not about other precautions. So we don't have a, I wouldn't call them huge expenditures, but obviously just like everybody else, uh, you know, we wanna make sure we have cleaning supplies and uh, some other provisions uh, for folks and so, uh, just the availability of those and, and ordering those have been uh, uh, probably the biggest demand. But, uh, you know, I don't see any extraordinary expenses uh, uh, in that regard. And, and our plan is to slowly bring people back uh, into our facilities and opening them back up uh, uh, in line with the, the governors or maybe even a little more conservative than the governors in some cases, depending on uh, uh, the practices that we're able to to put into place. One of the things that, and I know we had the public comment that uh, was relative to some of our uh, opportunities for children this summer, uh, because you know the 
school district has closed all of their uh, summer child care programs through Big Brothers and Big Sisters and, and clearly our, our little Apple Day Camp that we ran uh, was a, a very significant uh, number of folks and so uh, our Parks and Rec folks are, are putting their heads together about what are some uh, programs we might be able to do that are at least revenue neutral uh, to cost that we might be able to do with our own staff without hiring seasonals uh, and be able to accommodate some kids in some of our facilities uh, uh, that uh, are don't have a lot of risk and help uh, create some opportunities uh, for uh, at least uh, short-term programming opportunities and, and child care that uh, uh, may free up some folks to return to work and, and have some peace of mind with what's going to happen with their kids and, and try to have some impact on, on some numbers as opposed to traditionally it's been, yeah, well, if you were one of the lucky ones that got into the Little Apple Day Camp uh, or some of the other things. So uh, something that we can spread around uh, uh, to different uh, venues. So we're, we're looking at those opportunities uh, um, as long as the, uh, we can uh, abide by the rules that we have to and those are the uh, obviously more difficult in the short short run than they are in the long run so uh, uh, of the forecasting and financial experts that are you know predicting uh, a, a little a little V or a big V uh, as far as the decline in recovery or a W for a second resurgence uh, or an L which is you know a longer term decline and a slower recovery. All of those are different models that uh, uh, we're analyzing and, and tracking. And uh, the other thing that I would just point out is that uh, as we move forward, uh, unfortunately, I don't see the state changing our date when we have to adopt that budget in August. Uh, and so kind of on our schedule, um, we had talked originally about um, about having about the same number or maybe even less uh, uh, budget meetings. Uh, and I think because of this, we're probably gonna need uh, a few more. The next one we planned was uh, two weeks from tonight uh, uh, for the second work session and then uh, two more in June. There's actually a fifth Tuesday in June that we could potentially use for one as well. Uh, I know uh, uh, We've tried to streamline some of the ways the other advisory boards are taking input uh, on budgetary matters. So uh, we're hoping to get most of that accomplished uh, uh, in June and then a couple of work sessions uh, in July and then probably pushing our budget adoption till as late in August as we can. So I know generally we try to have that public hearing that first Tuesday in August and uh, we kind of supposed to have everything turned in and, and filed by, I think it's the third Tuesday in August, roughly. So we just, uh, uh, it's something we'll have more discussion on on our schedule moving forward and, and uh, kind of where you want to go from there. Jason, did you have something you wanted to add? I'm sorry, I stepped away. The question was just on schedule. Yeah, I didn't know if that, I, I kind of just ran through the opportunities we have moving forward and, and to, to talk about uh, different aspects of the, a lot of the traditional uh, public comments and, and board recommendations you get from SSAD and special alcohol and uh, those different meetings, which we would target uh, certainly in, in June, but we do have a fifth Tuesday in June that we could spend uh, additional time on on some of those matters and again we, we you know again we won't have uh, our April uh, date it won't we won't get until the end of June so uh, even in July uh, we'll have significant berries variances typically we, we uh, uh, come up with a budget that we publish uh, for public hearing in August uh, uh, the second legislative meeting in July, and we haven't even got the May's report then. So 
we may be pushing to stretch that out a little bit longer and push those deadlines um, and working with the commission to do that. Yeah, I think some of the feedback we've had tonight has is, is been really good. Go ahead, sorry. I was, I was Ron, just gonna run through real quick. Yep. Aaron? Yep. Sorry, it's delayed. Can't hear you. Um, Can you hear me now? Now, yeah. No? Okay. Okay. So uh, just real quick, I I'll run. I know this is this is probably unrealistic, um, but the state when we started the the legislature's legislative session, the governor and the state talked about that property tax relief, um, local property tax relief, right? Um, that that's very unlikely but uh, as uh, just the staff I'd like to s keep an eye on that I know you guys are but it also is important for the people across the city to understand that the state has been um, non-compliant in, in many regards of, of give, providing that ad valorem property tax relief back to uh, local municipalities in a way that could reduce their burden so if we have anything we want to fight for uh, and there's lots of things to fight for but that's one that the, the state could easily uh, help us out with property tax relief uh, for the local taxpayer but just to clarify earlier um, I didn't mention but the you know I, I want us to see uh, no increase in the mill levy that's the goal. Uh, I know I, I said starting point uh, zero for um, pay, but I also meant that to also include for us to get to a point where there's no increase in mill levy. I, I would like that to be the message that comes from the city uh, is that the city is not increasing your mill levy. Now, if the other entities are, that's, uh, that's something they're gonna have to figure out. I wanted to also say that I'm thankful for the leadership from the city manager's office for getting the city to this place where we have some flexibility. We can be a little bit uh, uh, proactive and not totally reactive and backed into a corner where we have this four, if we have a $4 million shortfall or gap in revenue, uh, there is some things that have been put in motion that, that give the city that flexibility. So it's, uh, it's not pretty, but it's also appreciated um, from my point of view. And in that sense, I want to go f keep the discussion going forward uh, as we have more work sessions on what Jason had talked about with that four-tiered type of strategic planning. Um, that that uh, you know, if we can do it without a consultant, even better. If we can save a hundred thousand dollars, you know, I don't, I don't. Uh, that that doesn't seem uh, unrealistic to me during these times that, that that the staff could pull that together and put that into personnel savings, uh, saving a job or two potentially. So that, uh, that but that four tiered model where there's citizen input, I want us to continue to leverage that. Uh, we have a pretty highly intelligent, at least we uh, the, the, the citizenry thinks often highly of themselves and their intelligence, and I tend to agree, uh, but uh, they're capable and often willing to give that and participate in a larger way. So we, I, if we can leverage that strength, we have that in this community where other cities don't, um, we really need to leverage that citizen input going forward uh, in that four tier type of system, any tiers types of cuts or programs. So I really appreciate that uh, and that's all I have. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, Linda? Go ahead, Linda. Yes. Um, Ron, I, I would like for you to go ahead and follow up with the Riley County Police Department and the county. Uh, the Riley County Police Department, uh, uh, the law board, is working on the budget now and will have to finalize the, that budget at least a month before the city does. I think it's in July is when their deadline is. 
And so we're going to need to have this worked out uh, sooner than the city's budget. Uh, but uh, it has to, it's going to have to be negotiated. We cannot, uh, as far as I'm concerned, keep RCPD and the library whole while we um, just gut everything we've got in order to do that. So there has to be something that's negotiated uh, to um, uh, that, that's fair. So I'll just leave it with that. I appreciate that comment. I've had some, some good conversations with Director Butler uh, about the circumstances. Uh, uh, you know, I think we will have a good idea by the end of this week uh, from uh, Raleigh County Treasurer Shiloh Hager, uh, who's on the uh, recovery task force, that uh, she indicated at least that she might have a decent idea where property tax revenue streams were. And, and that obviously is critical for both the RCPD and the library going forward. But even with that, uh, uh, those, those taxes trickle in uh, throughout the course of the year. Uh, one of the things that uh, you know, we've done the past couple of years is we've budgeted about a 2% delinquency in that fund. But you might recall when we were uh, approving the budget last year, uh, that was one of the slashes we made to reduce the, the overall mill levy impact uh, for the city mill levy. And I think we have, we're down to like a 0.7% uh, delinquency. So maybe about 70 grand for something that maybe originally would have been uh, closer to a few hundred grand. So uh, there's not a lot of delinquency included in there and so a lot of those uh, you know personal property taxes come in monthly the big ones come in in January and May but and then so we'll have a good line share so having a strategy for uh, those revenue shortfalls towards the end of the year uh, which would include you know uh, I know there's been a lot of debate about the emergency reserve fund uh, but if you know the president has declared a national emergency, and if the COVID-19 isn't an isn't an emergency, then I'm not sure what is. Uh, and, and if nothing else, maybe that gets rebudgeted as as part of the 2020 revised budget. So you take the money out of there and put it back into the general fund as a budget strategy, not just an expenditure from that fund. If that's something we need to do, but. Uh, Certainly, uh, uh, I would, uh, I'm happy to provide some comments uh, uh, to the law board members as well as uh, uh, our CPD administration on uh, some uh, potential options uh, moving forward for, uh, and, and we'll be talking about a revised 2020 budget, I'm quite sure. Uh, usually that's a budget uh, adjustment that we do in different funds, but and, and I see that happening again. But it's usually more of a positive this time. It'll be a negative um, as we reduce uh, some of those expenditures for 2020 as opposed to moving forward to 2021. So uh, and, and obviously uh, uh, some some tough decisions uh, to make there with uh, regard to those operations. I've had a short conversation with Linda about the library, anticipating that uh, that's something that they need to pay attention to as well. Yeah, I, I just wanted to Could say, I, uh, um, yes, Linda, go ahead. Oh, I just had a lingering question. Um, I had, from your earlier announcement, Ron, I understood that the zoo and the pools, all of those were gonna be closed. But then I heard on one of the Topeka television stations, their news program, that the Topeka Zoo and the Lawrence Zoo, I think, are going to go are going to be opening in a in a graduated way. And they had checked with Manhattan, and Manhattan was working on a plan. <laughs> and so that caused me to wonder if they really are closed for the rest. So I, I thought I'd ask. <laughs> So we are looking at, at uh, opportunities that we have that can we can reopen safely to the public. And, and it'll be a phased approach uh, for that. Obviously, you know, the zoo, we have uh, folks that uh, are working hard uh, on uh, uh, separating themselves to, to keep the animals fed. So 
what we don't have is uh, a lot of our seasonal staff that would help us uh, in that regard. And so, uh, but I, we are working on some options to be able to open uh, in a limited way uh, as best we can once uh, uh, most of the limitations are off. Thanks, John. Um, Jason, this is a question for you uh, or Ron. Um, the strategic study, uh, I already know, and I'm sure the rest of the commissioners know, you guys are working uh, numerous hours. When we talk about a strategic study, um, I'm thinking that that's at least a three to six month process, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's Is changed it's a little bit over not. the years. Yeah, and, and Julia Novak did Lawrence's uh, about a year, year and a half ago. And it, it's, they're a lot more condensed and they take a lot less time than they used to. Um, but we, you know, we can engage with some consultants or we can, you know, we can look at it internally too. I just, you know, COVID-19 has really changed the way we do business and how things get done. We spend a lot of our time trying to position the organization for the next two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks in light of what's going on. I mean, we spend an inordinate amount of time on that. Then you've got everything else that's trying to operate within the organization departmentally. Um, but taking care of the, our people, taking care of our facilities, it's, it's really chewed up a lot of our time. But, you know, strategically, we're gonna have strategies we're gonna put in front of you in May 26, in June at our other work sessions, in July, um, not only dealing with 2020, but dealing with 21 as well. Um, some of that will be strategic. Some of that will be, we understand, keep the mill levy flat. Here's some options for how we still accomplish some things, but yet uh, we got to put some scenarios out there, some men things on the menu for, for folks to choose from in terms of, here's our recommended strategy. Do you agree with that? Uh, and how do we accomplish some of those 2021 objectives in that way? Or you're right, we need to look at other scenarios too in terms of K-State not opening, a, a resurgence of COVID-19 that closes down the economy in some way. Um, K-State football and athletics and basketball don't occur. You're right, we need to look at those things. How do we position our organization in that manner? Um, K-State announcing the in-person was huge actually seeing it come to fruition is what we're all waiting for. Uh, but but you're, we have to look at these scenarios with these huge economic drivers in our community uh, either occurring or not occurring. And if COVID-19 resurges and there's another shutdown or another uh, response from the university, uh, from our school system, it clearly, uh, we know that is, greatly impactful to our revenue streams and we'll have to have strategies in place to react to that. And, and that's what I, I, that's why I'd rather have, uh, even though all of you have so much on your plate, uh, because you are so in the trenches, that, that's probably something you need to be planning anyway, looking at all the scenarios. Um, you know, you brought up all the factors about a resurgence of COVID-19 and all of that and what that might look like. So when we t I think we need to have a city, county, county meeting um, in May and uh, discuss the law board budget as well as the library budget, uh, mainly the law board one because the county and uh, the city, it's all funded by property taxes. And I think that's a discussion we need to have, not only with the May revenue for property taxes, but we don't know what December and January are gonna look like. And I think that's, that's the other piece we need to try to figure out as we plan a little bit further down the road. Um, so, yeah, and um, you said something about uh, getting, uh, in one of your PowerPoint slides, you had staff for operating the rec centers. How soon do we need to be doing that? Is that something we need to look at right now? Is that going to be happening in the short term? What do you see there? The Douglas Center will be completed by the end of the year. Uh, the Anthony Rec Center around the same time, January, February uh, of 21, and then Eisenhower about April, May of 21. Um, you know, again, can we use existing staff and have a minimal approach? Yes, we can. Um, 
it'll be a reduction in hours, it'll be a reduction in services type of approach. Yes, it's not what is expected. No, uh, we could even look at charging uh, to get in to those facilities to help us cover some of those costs. Uh, that's not what we went out when we had that question uh, for the community, but times have changed and we need to look at different uh, strategies we can. Uh, we're going to be looking at all kinds of strategies, whether it's from a revenue standpoint or a cost cutting standpoint in order for us to maintain services to the community. And the more we can talk about those scenarios, get feedback from you all and get feedback from the community. The reason I like a consultant is they've got it down pat. They can do it quickly. They can engage, they can get results and we can get topics back up in front of us in a quick manner. Um, we do have some delays occurring right now just because we're engaged so heavily with things that we're not used to engaged in with COVID-19. So, you know, we would even have to check with consultants to see if they have time to do it uh, between now and say the end of the year. But it could be something that um, I think could be productive. And we're, we're gonna be creating scenarios on our own, probably financially more so than this person, this program, this department, it'll be more percentage wise and we'll have to go figure it out as we realize those revenue streams. Yeah, I know. For the next six months, it might be just revenue streams and percentage wise. I think the next six months are just such a mess. Um, I don't know how you would plan for any of those. Um, either way, I don't know if we gave you enough information or maybe we just talked. Um, anything else from other commissioners? Yeah. Let so me just say that I think there's uh, more comments. this is great feedback. You know, our our thought process uh, for the next work session will we'll start creating some of those menus, uh, both for uh, potential additional reductions uh, in in different aspects of services to if we have to hit that eight million mark. Uh, and, and as we hit into some of those what ifs, as well as, you know, what are some of those other uh, uh, potential, you know, to, this is one of those times where you look at, at, at both sides of the ledger. And so uh, what are those fees, you know, that uh, we talked a little bit about that at the last budget, uh, where we were looking at potentially increasing some fees uh, that we hadn't changed much at all and so that'll be part of the mix too and so uh having that kind of comprehensive look at things uh will be will be important uh and then the the, the unknown mix of that or just uh, uh figuring out the mix i think uh, uh part of the federal strategy of rolling out the cares act has been uh, uh, there's a new department that's got a new strategy in the way that they're going to give the money to folks. <laughs> so it's kind of slowed down the process of, of how they're deliberating. We just saw that with the Economic Development Administration just rolled out their plan for uh, aid packages to, to state and local and private components. And so I think we'll continue to uh, you know, we're learning about federal agencies that we've never interacted with before that, that got a piece of that two trillion uh, to distribute. So, uh, you know, those are, those are good things, uh, but they take a lot of time to try and delineate. Uh, uh, you, you saw the governor's announcement, even though we're not eligible for the statewide CDBG funds, that was on a first come first serve basis. Uh, starting tomorrow, I think, is when they start taking applications. So some of these have very short turnaround time for you to, to try and get some access to. And so, uh, like I said, you know, if, if all of those big federal agencies were, were coming to us like the FAA did, we'd be in great shape. But unfortunately, they're not. So uh, we appreciate the feedback mm -hmm. and uh, look forward to uh, working with you and, and getting you additional information as well as to the community so they can uh, have a participation. And, and uh, uh, right now we're kind of targeting some of our June meetings to be hopefully back uh, uh, together face to face. Uh, we're still working on some of those reopening plans, but that's kind of the, the thinking that we'll be in and it'll have a dependency on where the state is. Uh, from the 
gatherings and other restrictions. Um, and you also, with all of these other programs, uh, consumer confidence needs to be there as well. Even if everything is open, I don't know how many people are going to be going out and doing things normal like they used to. Uh, when you talk about the Douglas Center and all of these other ones, we were usually thinking about the senior population or the vulnerable populations. So we don't know what kind of confidence is there for them to come back and be as engaged and interactive at that time either. Uh, another piece to consider. Okay, I am not looking, I mean, I, I don't like Zoom meetings, but I'm more, very cautious about having in-person meetings still. So I don't mind if we have some more Zoom meetings in the next couple of months. Um, with that said, is there anything else add, to add to the conversation or for Ron and Jason? I'll, I'll just add real quick that uh, austerity is kind of the watchword, but at the same time, um, I am such a, a, a fan of, of the work to bring, I guess, everyone to the table and to have that uh, collective input into what kind of sacrifices we have to make. And I think uh, both of you have said uh, that, you know, we're going to try to do, and you said it more in budget terms, but in, in you know, in a layman's way, we're going to, we're doing more with less um, and doing more with less is hard it's hard for morale it's hard for everybody but uh, know that I totally uh, am supportive and I want you and the city to know that uh, we we're here to try to to get through this together uh, austerity is not fun but cr that creativity that you mentioned is going to be potentially the fun part Appreciate that. Okay, with that, and shall we adjourn? If there's no more to add, since we confused them enough. Okay, we are done for the evening, and we will see you next Tuesday at our regular Legislative City Commission meeting at 7. Thank you all. <laughs>